first of all, uh, just a note on the title. Although it does say uh, a band of brothers, we did include sisters in this project. Uh, it just would have messed up my alliteration for the title. Of this. <laughs> so just get out of the way. Um, in this talk, uh, I'm talking about an Operation Nightingale project that I've been involved in uh, as an uh, archaeological supervisor. It's out in France on a battlefield site at Bullecourt. Uh, so far, this excavation has had two seasons. Uh, back in 2017, we started. We did another one last year. Uh, we almost started on the actual uh, anniversary of the battle that we were looking at, in particular. And hopefully, uh, if we get funding, so please give us some funding, uh, we'll be able to do some more excavations over the next couple of years. Uh, alongside the physical excavation work, there's also been geophysical surveys and surveys and field walking as part of the wider project. And all of these parts of this project have involved veterans at every level. Uh, so in this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a short background of the project, the history of it, uh, some of the, uh, show you some of the treasure that we found, and it's beautiful. Uh, then also explore how it feels to be an outsider as an archaeologist when working with ex-service men and women, along with a brief examination of some of the benefits for the participants. So I'm hoping that Graham hasn't already stolen my thunder on this one, but we'll see. So, in April of 1917, uh, as part of the larger battle of Arras, the Australian soldiers of the 4th Division attacked uh, Bullecour village, who was on the Hindenburg line, a German defensive line, you can see here, it's uh, from the internet. This is the German front line, British front line, of April 1917. The Australians attacked across here. Uh, very pertinent today because it is Anzac Day, lest we forget. Uh, the Australians won't let us forget. Uh, and this operation was conducted with the British 62nd Division. I mentioned those because they were York uh, Yorkshire regiments were involved in that, their attack. Uh, the attack was supported by British Mark II tanks, and it was designed as a flanking operation to draw German units from the, uh, the bigger operation around Arras in the north. Uh, the village of Bullecourt was part of the German defensive line, as I said, part of the Hindenburg line. Uh, unfortunately, due to a combination of rushed plans, bad weather, uh, a change in de German defensive tactics, the Australians failed to gain their objectives at Bullecourt. They later blamed this failure on the British tanks. Australian accounts of the battle claim the British tank crews abandoned their vehicles before they could have an impact on the fighting. Uh, however, the tanks had only been introduced the previous September. The crews were still getting, to, uh, getting used to the tactics to use with these things. Uh, the shell crater landscape of the battlefield was not ideal ground uh, for the conditions of the vehicles. And they were also under armoured. The reason the Mark IIs were under armoured is because they were training tanks and they'd actually been rushed from the training areas into the battle in April of uh, 1917. So all of this com combined together uh, basically added up to the, the failures of these vehicles. So in 2017, an archaeological project began, uh, the process of identifying and recovering the remains of the final resting places of some of these vehicles. Uh, this was led by Richard Osgood, the senior DIO archaeologist. Uh, I'll not mention his other title because I want to keep my job. However, uh, in the bottom left-hand corner there, you can see a very, very rare shot of Richard actually working. That's the VAR sorted. The project sort of clarified the British tanks had actually reached the village. Uh, also, what could be identified beyond a patch of oil in the ground of these things? And were the tanks as useless as the Australians had claimed? So with support from Breaking Ground Heritage, uh, the project enlisted the help of wounded, injured and sick, known in the military terms as WIS, veterans, uh, for, a part, uh, for a series of archaeological projects under the Operation Nightingale Banner. <coughs> this is a, a Ministry of Defence-led initiative. It seeks to make recovery for the armed forces veterans suffering from mental and physical injuries. Uh, and as we've seen previously, uh, archaeology can be very useful in this as it requires teamwork, patience, attention to detail and in a group such as WIS veterans, uh, teamwork is particularly important uh, as all of them have been trained to work as a team in their previous professions uh, when they're working in the various units. I'm going to get more, more into that later on. A particular emphasis is given to veterans with no archaeological experience 
And one of the many aims of Operation Nightingale is to provide participants with vocational transferable skills. In this, it's been rather successful, with many Op Nightingale participants, one of them right here, uh, have gone on to study archaeology at university and also work in the commercial world. Our very own Dickie Bennett, down on the frontier, we've been quiet so far, uh, created Breaking Ground Ber uh, Heritage after his initial participation in an Operation Nightingale project. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, I thought someone could do it better, wouldn't they? <laughs> Indeed. So, the results of the excavation were actually nothing short of spectacular. In this French farmer's field, this very little Sunni French farmer's field, uh, we found we, were, we concentrated on a particular tank. It was this tank here, tank number 796. It was commanded by Lieutenant Skinner in April of 1917, and he'd been identified on aerial photographs after the battle, and also in clips filmed by the Germans, which this is taken from, you can see it's part of their Bundesarche archive. Uh, there's about a five minute clip of this tank and these German soldiers climbing in out of it. Uh, there was a great, uh, good deal uh, known about the general location of the tank, however, how much of it was actually left was, on, was an unknown. Uh, the battlefields after the war were cleared by the Chinese Labour Corps, and then also later by French farmers reclaiming their, uh, their land as well, uh, back in the early 1920s. So many of the Bullock Corps tanks were either dragged off the field or put up for scrap. However, it wasn't long before we found definite proof of tank. Now this like, might look like a bit of a tractor, but let me assure you, it definitely is not. <coughs> this is a tank. Uh, what we have here is uh, the chain from one of the engines, and these long sections of metal actually turned out to be this. A six foot long section of tank track. Uh, it still retained its grouses, these were for uh, providing grip, these are these things here, and you can see the various uh, rivets and the bolts holding this thing together. And more excitingly, it actually still retained parts of its original paint. Now, all the First World War tanks that you see in museums, I know there isn't any here, but there are, there's a couple dotted around the country, have all been repainted since the First World War, so we're not actually entirely sure what colour these tanks were. So, to find this paint was actually amazing, it's incredible, you know. Uh, our photographer, Harvey, Harvey Mills, had uh, analysed the paint and came up with the Pantone colour of 560C. Now, you all know what 560C is, don't you? <laughs> yeah? Well, you do actually, it's pretty close to British Racing Green. This is a vehicle that does no more than four miles an hour. <laughs> Somebody somewhere is taking a piss. Right. I'm not going to go to, into this too much. I mean, we can, we can talk about this later on uh, over tea, and I'm sure we all will do. Uh, the second season revealed even more tank parts, including some more incredible parts, such as this oil tap. Again, this may not look like much, but there's only two of these in existence. There's one in the Hobbington Tank Museum and this one. So again, even these tiny little things that are coming off these massive machines are, you know, uh, revealing things about the First World War for us. We also excavated direct evidence for the fighting in April of 1917. This six-pounder shell here was excavated by Paul, one of the veterans, who, by happy coincidence, was a veteran of the Royal Artillery. Uh, it was, you can date ammunition quite nicely from the head stamps. And this one was dated to April of 1917. So not only this, did this find demonstrate that ammunition was being rushed straight from factories in the UK into France and being used in the frontline fighting, but also that this tank was still firing its guns as it was <coughs> in the Hindenburg line. So it's given us a slightly different view of the tank crawl of the car than the Australians had. Uh, we have a less than perfect weapon being used in the thick of the fighting with a brave crew firing their weapons as best they could in an under-armoured vehicle. Unfortunately, the casualties of the First World War are rarely far away. In a shell crater, the remains of three German soldiers lay below the tank track. And when I say below the tank track, I mean below the tank track. Uh, we're not entirely sure why the tank track is on top of uh, this chap here, and it's most likely to cover him, but it probably hasn't been run over by the tank. Uh, 
The third body was below the two that you can see here, and he was recovered later in 2018. We identified the, German, uh, the soldiers as Germans from their buttons and boots, uh, but before we were actually positive of their identification or nationality, there was every possibility that these men were part of the tank group of 796. Uh, this possibility brought with it a very unexpected situation. Uh, having worked as an archaeologist on battlefield sites for nearly two decades, I'm used to being face to face with great war dead. However, they're generally skeletonized, but there's something very different about the great war dead because until we find them, they are definitely missing. Uh, up until that point, they have no known grave. Most will probably not even be afforded the luxury of the same kind of burial that we get, uh, that you find most archaeological examples have. However, the Bullet Corps project made this difference even more striking because we have veterans on site. Uh, some of these had suffered traumatic combat experience. Peter, for example, a veteran of the Royal Tank Regiment, had suffered in an IED attack on service. He lost friends in it. Uh, I have asked him if I can talk about him, so you're fine with us. Uh, for him, the thoughts of these men were possibly his unit's ancestors proved to be a psychological trigger. However, having Kaylee here, uh, a mental health specialist with whom he was able to discuss his feelings and work away through the psychological challenges, ensured that not only Peter was able to come back, you see him here sitting on the side watching the excavation, but he was actually in the trench helping us clean these bodies before removal. What was even touching while he was doing this, and something that I've never been witness to as an archaeologist, uh, was Peter was actually reassuring the Germans that they'd been found. So, turning away from the results of the excavations, uh, which as I say, I'm sure all of us will be happy to chew your ears off about, uh, let's have a look at some of the outcomes of the participation in Operation Nightingale projects. Sometimes, despite being poles apart in many ways, the similarities between the worlds of the military and the archaeology uh, both have their own jargon, uh, occasionally closed ranks, and also, dare I use such a word as SIFA, their own rituals. But both the military and archaeology seem to also enjoy getting mucky, unless it's the OEF, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. <laughs> and the drinking goes without saying. <laughs> But being involved in Operation Nightingale for projects gives me an insight into a world of the art forces that a lot of archaeologists generally don't get. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on military ways, and I don't think as far as I will ever live that I will understand the military mindset. But I also get to appreciate parts of their world through these Operation Nightingale projects. One of the most striking aspects, and this has been touched on previously, uh, is a camaraderie and group bonding that begins almost immediately. I'm generalizing here again, but the participant, participant, participants, many of whom have never met one another before, uh, feel like an organic unit even before the end of the first day. And this, as I mentioned, is part of the military mindset. They're trained to work as a team from day one, and this flicks straight back in again uh, as soon as they're working together. Uh, it's very noticeable uh, that the group bonds quickly, creates a certain ten, uh, sense of team with a purpose, and this is something that I have noticed does happen again and again on Operation Nightingale projects. However, one must have a very thick skin to survive, and any weakness shown is exploited. They will absolutely roast your life for any slight infraction, uh, such as having served in the RAF regiment, for example. Uh, also, my pathological hatred of the band U2 was immediately seized upon, and I was known as Bono for the rest of the excavation. <laughs> and I'll not tell you how they treated me when it was discovered I'd forgotten my passport. <laughs> but as soon as you stumble, there's no end of people there to help you up again. A case in point. When the German soldiers were discovered, and we realised we didn't have enough time to lift the bodies that day, uh, we had no security on, to, on site, Richard asked for a volunteer to stay overnight just to make sure nobody came on to do anything. To war. It has happened in the past. Every single one of the veterans volunteered. So the excavation of the German soldiers of the Bullet Corps demonstrated an unbroken link between the members of the armed forces now and yesterday. And what made this even more apparent and moving was a speech given by Jans, here, a German veteran who had joined the group part way through. Here is Jans. Uh, he was a witness to the recovery of the human remains. Jan's speech was touching not only because he was a modern German salute to fallen comrades, but also because he and several others in the group were vi uh, visibly moved by the experience. 
And being involved in a Operation Nightingale project is not just a jolly, it also serves towards recovery for people suffering from mental health problems. As part of the involvement in the Op Nightingale project, the veterans are given a questionnaire uh, at the beginning uh, and middle and end of the work. And these were designed by Dickie Bennett, who now has a growing body of empirical evidence that's on the whole, participation in the Op Nightingale project is helpful towards recovery and well-being for the veterans. This table shows you some of the uh, anonymized data from Bunkar. Uh, this was gathered by Breaking Ground Heritage. Uh, various, various questions, they focus on general well-being through a series of prompts. And the question is, are far more involved than what I'm demonstrating here, but I've drawn this particular one out as an example just to show you. And what we can see from this small sample of participants on the Bullocor excavations, there's an increase in overall well-being from the beginning of the project compared to the lot of stages. Now, the caveat, I'm not going to argue the participation in the Operation Nightingale project is a cure for traumatic and mental health issues. That would not only be tried to, but also be reductive as well. But let me emphasize this point. This is only a small sample of a larger participant group from all the Operation Nightingale projects. But Dickey has quite a lot of evidence here, uh, information that generally mirrors these results. So this is not just anecdotal now, but uh, Dickey now has data on this kind of thing. So to sum up, an Operation Nightingale project, uh, on an Operation Nightingale project, the work is carried out to a high standard. Excavations reveal some truly amazing artifacts uh, from uh, First World War uh, uh, battlefields, which further our information about a specific battle of the First World War. Further, and we may more argue more importantly, the Operation Nightingale projects are incredibly influential in the development and recovery for people suffering from far-reaching and deeply embedded mental health issues. Thank you very much for listening.